where um, I was in. Then, you know, the environment was cleaned up. The first time I was hearing about this stuff. Wow. It was totally new to me. Adept with Social Impact Consulting. Hello everyone, my name is Efwa Ellens Ede with Social Impact Consulting. I'm a development consultant with 20 years of experience working with NGOs, international NGOs, and bilateral agencies to work in project support, monitoring and evaluation, and civil society strengthening. So now, I saw that local NGOs lack the capacity to manage large-scale projects, which can in turn impact their various communities because they have the connection based on their backgrounds. So this made me create this channel so that I can add value to you for free once you subscribe to this channel and get notified of upcoming videos. I look forward to hearing from you. to another episode of Dev Sector Series. I'm very excited. As you know, I'm always excited about these sessions because I get to talk to development professionals who are passionate about their work and talking about some of the happenings in the dev sector, in the development sector. So I'm very excited about that. So thank you so much. Like I and holds a BA in History from the University of Nigeria, an MSc in Political Science from Amadubelo University, and an Executive Management Certificate from Oxford University. Allow me to present to some and introduce to others Mr. Charles Abani, UN Resident Coordinator in Ghana. Hello, Charles. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, Efwa. And good afternoon <laughs> to everybody who's on the program, too. It's a, it's a privilege for me. Thank you. So what's it like in Ghana? How are you doing out there? Well, Ghana is really nice. Uh, it's quiet. It's uh, a bit more organized than, than Nigeria is. So it's cool, and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> That's really, really good. I mean, once once I, I posted that uh, we're going to be having a conversation with you, I got so much excitement. So um, we're just looking forward to this exciting conversation you're, you're going to have with us. I, I, I so, hope um, I live up your expectations. Uh, you will. We will. We trust you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you know, now we're seeing you as a diplomat and, uh, you know, working on. So anytime I'm looking at Charles now, I'm thinking SDGs, the UN, 2030 goals. So that's kind of the theme that we're going to be looking at on today. So I'm just going to get right to it. So our first question is, is a very big one. So how is the African continent faring on SDGs? What's the progress, any stagnation, any regression? So can you just give us some insight on that? Thank you. Thank you, F1. And just to, to conclude, it, it's actually really exciting to be here in Ghana. Um, I, I think um, we live in a time of uh, particularly a lot of doom and gloom, uh, particularly on the African continent and back home. And to be in a place that is excited, committed, um, taking rhetoric to plans and action is, is absolutely exciting. I just came off a call, uh, the Global Sustainable Development uh, Investment Fair, which is a key plank upon which uh, I think progress will be made, where Ghana and Pakistan uh, were presenting a pipeline of investment projects to a range of private sector actors globally. And so to be in that kind of exciting place uh, with commitments, from the president uh, downwards is, is really a great place um, to be. So back back to your sort of question on the SDGs, and I think just a, just a few points from me at the very beginning. 
I think national development, local development is the SDGs. The, those SDGs um, aren't a separate track of work. And for a long time, I think people have always kind of tried to deal with them as if there's something different from, from national development. Uh, but they're not. And so the, the question really is how a country is doing in terms of meeting the basics for, for everybody, um, in terms of access to health, uh, access to education, equality, um, you know, zero poverty and hunger, among other things. And, and in the way that I like to dissect the, uh, or separate out the SDGs, I, I often say that, you know, the government has a primary responsibility for the first six. Uh, those six SDGs that, that account for, if you like, the enablers that then enable everybody else to progress. Um, and obviously SDG 17, creating an enabling environment for that. But the rest of the SDGs around sort of um, sustainable energy, around industrialization, around infrastructure, all of those um, really involve uh, everybody. Um, and actually, if the government does the best it can on those and, and SDG 16, which is about strengthening institutions, then I think uh, people have the capacity to do the rest. And um, Nigeria, on its best day, has demonstrated that capacity, not just in country, but, but globally. So, you know, how are we doing? Um, you know, there's progress in some areas. Um, uh, there's a lot of stagnation. Um, and in some places, there's regression. I think context is really important uh, on the continent. Just a couple of days ago, I looked at a map on, on conflict and I shared it in a couple of forums um, in Nigeria where literally we are almost surrounded by a sea of red. And so in those places where conflict is growing, um, it's, it's really difficult to see um, progress. And obviously, I, I know we'll talk a bit about COVID-19. Um, you know, it was already difficult, even in the best of places. Ghana itself, uh, where I'm working, has made significant progress on a number of the core areas. But in order to really, really um, move forward and achieve 2030, uh, much, much more needs to be done. Um, I'll talk a bit about some of the big things, but I think sustainable finance to enable these things to happen, which is effectively sustainable finance for national development, is a key thing that is squeezing, that is squeezing countries um, today. And any, any country that wants to really engage with and make sure that its own national development is aligned to and contributing to achieving these SDGs will, will have to have a sustainable, reliable, transparent um, process of resource allocation and expenditure to enable that um, to, to happen. And so mid middle-income countries like Ghana and Nigeria on paper um, face a different set of challenges um, as they see, seek to leapfrog to the next level and begin to create self-reliance uh, models and actually rely less and less on donor inputs, on borrowing that is really meeting basic services, but really the engine begins to turn on. For poorer countries who are facing crisis and a number of them who are Emerging middle class countries or middle income countries who are being pushed back into crisis, places like Ethiopia, the challenges are, are, are huge um, for them. And as I've said, you know, COVID-19 has just not helped. Um, and for many, the battle is just to survive COVID-19 first before discussing these bigger um, issues. Let me stop there. Interesting. It's a really interesting way of looking at it in terms of making sure that in-house um, countries are able to get their their systems together in terms of transparency and financing and then also um, even some of the security challenges that some other countries are, are dealing with to even make sure that they're able to fulfill some of, some of these goals. Um, thank you so much for your feedback on that. So we're going to go into the next question. You talked about COVID-19 that you were going to get into it. So in the context of COVID-19, as we know, the UN um, through the World Health Organization, um, what is really on the helm of affairs in creating awareness and in working with other countries to make sure that we're 
able to address the pandemic. So in the African context, what are the challenges and the opportunities? Where are the challenges and opportunities? Uh, thank you. And um, let me say before, before even COVID-19 came and last year, the, the UN Secretary General, um, just ahead of the COVID pandemic, really talked about the, the, end, the end to conflicts. And, you know, in last year's um, sort of International Day of Peace, you know, I, I said that really peace is the rocket fuel of development. And many countries um, have both the potential to achieve the SDGs and to become to take their place on the global stage, but they cannot do this without peace. Um, peace is a constant distractor, or conflict is a constant distractor, and a constant sapper of energy. And I think particularly because I know the audience here is, is principally Nigerian, actually really focusing on what will bring peace uh, and unity is foundational to actually being able to, to, to engage in the takeoff. Uh, and of course, then came the, the COVID pandemic and caught us all uh, in the middle of, of everything. Um, and clearly, in this context, we had a shift. And as you point out rightly, first, COVID was was identified as a as a health um, related uh, challenge, uh, exposing the fragility in our health systems and the absolute inadequacies that we face in terms of dealing with this stuff. That even today we know we're facing challenges. We have not invested appropriately in, in R&D and are at best going to be recipients through COVAX and, and other facilities of vaccines largely manufactured by others. And so I welcome, I think yesterday there was a huge conversation at the Africa Union level to begin to look at um, how we can develop the capacity on the continent, not just to the downstream consumers of uh, vaccines that are, that are not making necessary, but producers of these, so that we have a, a better grasp uh, on the future that we face. But clearly, uh, COVID has created many challenges, and some of them relate to the opportunities. Um, hundreds of millions of new vulnerable people who we can't even map. We don't know where they are. Uh, Nigeria is just in the process of even figuring out how to log people into the NIN system. How do you track this? Yes. Target, how do you target resources to the vulnerable people that you know who are most likely to be vulnerable? How do you even identify who the new vulnerable people are as you try to respond um, to them? Uh, and obviously the impact of COVID lockdowns has been huge on the socioeconomic front as well. So it isn't just about restoring health systems, it's about restoring livelihoods, um, it's about preventing people who are slipping into vulnerability from slipping into vulnerability. It's uh, addressing the significant challenges already there, uh, of sexual and gender-based violence, which were exacerbated particularly by the lockdown, the sense of injustice and marginalization um, increases. It's about a fledgling I don't know, largely informal economic context in which small and micro businesses were literally wiped out. Some of them were surviving on a day-to-day -day basis and literally were wiped out. And again, as I say, without data, even the best government with the best intentions cannot target uh, incentives or, or palliative measures directly um, to those groups without um, data. So if anything, beyond fragile systems, that enables uh, target to while still leaving you highly indebted. Uh, and so not only do you have new debts that you need to, to accrue in order to address the uh, health-related challenges, but then you're left in the context of, of real macroeconomic uh, instability, which means that over the longer haul, those investments that are being made to enable um, a sustainable march towards the SDGs become um, even harder. And then, you know, kind of I started out by talking about conflict and peace, and peace being the rocket fuel and engine 
But in times of difficulty like this, uh, difference is exacerbated more than togetherness. And so in a, in a continent that is full of strife and conflict, um, those inequalities are exacerbated. They express themselves in terms of poor social cohesion. They express themselves in terms of poor community resilience mechanisms. And so what you have is a recipe for spiraling disaster, at best stagnation, um, if not regression. So it can be a very bad story. But uh, I think we should also look at what the opportunities offer um, for okay. us. Definitely. Um, and I think um, there's no way that, uh, you know, every, as, as the saying goes, every crisis is an opportunity and, and we have Definitely. to use it. Definitely. And I think there are many sectors, and I'm sure there are lots of people on this uh, conversation who will identify different sectors that are absolutely essential to, to engage in. Um, the way that the UN approached it across the board was to look at sort of five key things, make sure that health systems are strong, uh, begin to look at how to ensure and protect access to basic services. We know what's happened to education. We know what's happened to, uh, uh, if you like, social safety nets in, in a period like this. We know also what's happened to women. Women have borne the brunt of this. this disadvantaged groups have been most impacted. But then also to look at how you can support economic recovery, if not even recovery, survival of that economy, while looking broadly to to re-engineer macro plans, because unless you re-engineer those macro plans, you don't have the basis for, for sustainability uh, moving forward. And I think what I want to talk about are probably like four key things that I think are, are essential opportunities. One is this question of sustainable finance. Um, Ghana is, uh, and it's great to be a very proud nation with a very strong ambition. Um, in fact, they, they articulated in a document called Ghana Beyond the League. And, and you know, as, as Rwanda has, and as a few other countries have, their aspiration is, is more long term, and it is linked to becoming a self-reliant um, country. And so all the steps below that uh, are very linked into that. And that's certainly a, le a lesson for Nigeria as we keep rolling between 2020 visions and 2030 visions. Are we clear about that? And I think that's really important. But sustainable finance is key because the global financial systems comes with global rules, and we know that global rules often favor particular economies and particular countries that have debt. So how do we use this opportunity to rethink financing? I, I think it's less than a week ago I actually sat on, on or at least I, I, witnessed, I was sitting in on a conversation about Nigeria's debt um, and debt cancellation and debt forgiveness and the opportunity for Nigeria in the context of this. But Really, unless you have a sustainable finance uh, mechanism, things will not work. What new domestic resource generation is possible uh, within those contexts? Um, how, is, how do we move from a, an availability of money, which is more of a funding model, to a financing and investment model? That means that we are spending money on the right things that themselves catalyze and create or create transformation that then builds builds an energy around things. So how is public finance, um, you know, invested in a way that attracts private finance? And increasingly, certainly in the UN, uh, all heads are turning now to the role of the private sector. And uh, so again, the SDGs is not about government. It's about how government may be at best is providing sort of um, a reassurance um, and providing a basis for, for financing um, for the private sector to come in, but very much relying on the private sector to generate the significant global uh, resources required. What the globe needs to achieve the SDGs uh, is less than two days of transactions on the global stock exchange. And so that tells us the money is there, but we have failed to be able to figure out how to really harness this money. And if we achieve industrialization, create jobs, build a, a resilient economies, then the SDGs will automatically be achieved. And so we need to think again about how we focus on just the government doing this, but identifying what the government does around that. And then sort of sitting beneath this, um, really um, 
important factor of finding sustainable, impactful, impacting and impactful finance are, I guess, three, three, three real key opportunities. One of the other global climate crisis, and we know that, that even as we speak, and, and um, mineral resources that are actually becoming dated. How, does, how, does, how do our economies use this opportunity to get this sustainable in finance and invest in green growth? Green growth that is actually looking over the horizon at the opportunities that are ahead of us. Um, so see. what does this mean in terms of the kinds of finance that we're looking for, um, mm. kinds of resources, the kinds of industry that we want to build, the value chains in agriculture, which is a, a key mainstay in a country like Nigeria, what are those value chains going to look like? Um, and how green will they be? Um, in the context of pollution and plastics, how, how are we seizing the opportunity to revisit the way in which we use both our riverine and coastal resources? And um, how are we really creating those opportunities that will enable us to be part of that big global um, economy? I think the second thing I've alluded to so I talked about big finance, green growth, um, the digital transformation that COVID-19 has expressed is, is it's un enormous. Un yeah. undeniable. Yeah. Uh, if you break it into three things, it's about production. Um, how, how are we going to live, produce and grow in a digital economy? And, and so what kinds of investments are needed there? How are we going to learn in a world of digital in which um, we have seen interruptions in the way that, that young people are learning and the way that knowledge is transferred and exchanged. How are we going to do that? And for Africa, and particularly for countries like Nigeria, how are we going to use this to improve governance? What kind of systems do we need to mm -hmm. we can track? We can track resources, we can track people, and we can make the right kinds of investments in the right spaces. And so digital, whether you're working in agri, whether you're working in health, education, across the board how how are we taking advantage of this but also how are we owning it because it's so easy for us to become yet again and consumers in this and so beyond kind of like investing in the knowledge and the partnerships with the big global digital giants how are we protecting and owning our data what's the data governance systems we have in place on the continent that means exactly. that we are at, the, at the back end of that Exactly. And I think finally, finally, of course, and I would say this inclusion, um, if we're learning any lessons from COVID, it is that certain communities have been hit harder. So when we talk about green growth, we must talk about inclusive growth. And I think uh, that means that we must revisit, not just from a protection point of view, the rights of women and other excluded groups, but also ensure that we're involved in the right dialogues that are including those people in the conversation. If we don't have inclusive growth, we will not be able to reap the di digital uh, dividends. A lot of the, the tech capacity sits with young people. Um, for con a continent full of 65% and above of young people, ensuring that we are creating the opportunities that enable them to actually um, occupy the economic space and become the giants of tomorrow. If we're not thinking in this way, then we are likely um, to fail. So I think, for me, those are particular um, opportunities that that really need to be enhanced. And I think so. Finally, I would say partnerships. And often we say partnerships glibly, but the truth is that the construction of the kinds of relationships that are going to be required, particularly when we come to the MSME sector, where a lot of African businesses are. Uh, are really complex and no, no one set of institutions can do all that is required. And so for us, certainly in the UN, positioning ourselves to be able to connect uh, better, to help to connect those dots and ensure that big finance finds big projects, but small finance finds small projects uh, and those things are connected in a sustainable way. Um, so I think these are some of the big opportunities, whether you sit in health or education or you are concerned about economic growth or you're concerned about um, the macroeconomy within which the stability required to enable us 
I, I, you know, a lot of talk about build back better. I say build forward better um, in a way that will, will be effective. That, that is really very comprehensive, talking about in the context of 19, the, the, the immense challenges that we have and then the opportunities which kind of lifted us up. A better fit for purpose in supporting the achievement of the SDGs, especially for developing countries just like here in Africa. So, so thanks. I, I smile when people say I'm a diplomat. And I, yeah, I guess I am. Uh, but you know, I think more.
system um, that, that works on a good day for everybody partially, but particularly on a bad day works really bad for Africa. So how are we supporting growing value chains uh, that mean that uh, cocoa producers in Ghana are less vulnerable to the price, um, price fluctuations when there is a crisis? How are we supporting industrialization, use of uh, key mechanisms like the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement to begin to create opportunities for Africans to, to grow and trade among themselves primarily and, and maybe work harder on making sure that those businesses that, that are supported through mechanisms like AFTA are, are effectively benefiting and growing African businesses and particularly African women's businesses because they have been disadvantaged in a way that, that enables them to gradually um, come forward. And let's be this purveyor of just global standards um, from, from on high um, and in, in fact be more, more I always say both are important, but be, be more contextually, you could say bottom-up driven in the way that we are both planning and providing services, um, support and advice. And I think the last thing that the UN must stop being um, is a deliverer of services. Um, and this is particularly important. Um, our, our greatest, um, I guess, comparative advantage is a set of competencies and skills and, and insights that come from that global picture. It's a privilege, privileging place to be and a humbling space. Certainly since I joined here, to see the breadth of what 24 agencies, uh, UN agencies do across Ghana, from everything from supporting policing services on the one hand, to children and, and fighting disease, to uh, labor rights for domestic workers, uh, to food systems and food security systems, a huge privilege, but also lots of access to information. There are competent um, both government agencies and civil society actors and private sector actors in any of these countries who can actually do more. Um, and so we must step away from doing more and be more supportive in the way that we engage and do things. And particularly, uh, we were told we must empower young people to really become the engines of change. So I think these are very important dimensions here. Don't don't create the mold, don't recreate the mold, build it from the bottom and, and listen more to what, what people are saying. That's really interesting. So the UN is really trying to kind of shape itself to accommodate um, each of its member countries because it's not a one size fits all type of thing and to make sure that the, the UN is more of an enabler for uh, countries to be able to empower them to kind of to keep moving forward um, like you said in terms of healthcare, helping with policing and some of the some of the services that you are supporting in uh, in where you are in Ghana so we're almost rounding up I have a few questions in the comments so if you have any questions those of you who are watching if you have any questions please put them in the comment section and then we'll be happy to answer them as soon as we're done I know that there are some questions lined up uh, locked and loaded for you uh, Charles uh, so <laughs> So we're going to be moving. So this is going to be more of a personal question for you. So um, how are you finding the role of the UN <laughs> resident coordinator? So what are some of the challenges? This is a question from me to you because I've been wondering like, what's it been like? You know, yeah. so what are some of the challenges you're facing and what are some of the opportunities? So, uh, yeah, great. And, and when I told uh, folk I was taking on this job, the more forthright among them said, I, are you truly the diplomat, Charles? Can you be this diplomat? <laughs> uh, my, update, my update to you all is I'm learning and I'm learning fast and hard uh, okay. how, to be, uh, how to be a diplomat. Uh, okay. And I think it's, uh, I think, uh, no, it's exciting. As I said, it's a privilege. The breadth of it is, is enormous. Um, whatever hair I had left has since... Uh, <laughs> disappeared <laughs> but, but I think um, but I think it's certainly um, a, a huge opportunity to bring together the years of experience that I've had um, while still climbing a, ve a very steep uh, learning curve in terms of um, beginning to understand the country well I think Ghana is a good place generally uh, a friendly country yes we we have our jollof rice wars and I'm sure we'll continue to have I'm sure we'll continue to have those jollof rice wars. But I think 
there are a lot of uh, strong yeah, positions. Yeah, neutral on that one, Avi. No problem. <laughs> As you can see, I have become the diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and really kind of a, a huge opportunity to, to connect with a range of development partners and work together to achieve this. Obviously, significant uh, challenges, um, both for me personally is the culture shock, uh, joining a system that's quite different. But I think also for those uh, as we join and also begin to say, why don't we do things differently? But I think that's the job. Uh, and that's what makes it exciting every day when you get up. If, if it was that good, um, and I was able to go to the golf course, then I wouldn't really be adding value here. So, you know, exciting is, is how I would put it. Okay, that's that's really good. Uh, that's really good that you're finding the yeah finding the role uh, both exciting and challenging. And because initially, when I found out that you took this role, I'm like, okay, he's going to be a diplomat. Okay, let's see how this plays out. And it looks <laughs> like that very very well. <laughs> So, um, so do you have any final thoughts for us um, before we go into the questions from the from the audience? Maybe, maybe let's deal with with, with any questions from from the audience. Okay, let's then, okay, see, let's do whether, that. Yeah. The first question is from Kingsley Atang. He said, "How is the UN measuring the positive impact from nonprofits that contribute to SDGs?" So, I mean, this is an important thing. And, and uh, in November last year, we had a, a high level visit from the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Amina Mohammed, to Ghana. Um, and both at that, uh, during her visit and subsequently earlier this year, we, we've had a, a set of interesting conversations with civil society about the role that civil society really needs to play. Um, and it, it's always mixed. It's uh, certainly one, uh, our point is the UN needs to get uh, closer to, to civil society. I mean, I've had a historical bent towards that, but they have played a strong role in December um, or sort of in the lead up to the December elections here, which promised um, to be potentially conflictual. Uh, in fact, uh, Chidi Odinkalu in his, um, in his press briefing to the, the, the Financial Times that said Ghana's elections are boring. There's no, not going to be any fight. <laughs> <don't agree> <laughs> but I think actually civil society played a very strong role in, in the peace process brokering that. And I think civil society, once it is credible, can begin to play that role. And so civic actors were the key ones who brought the key political parties to the table to really push for a, a peace accord and a peace roadmap that led to uh, peaceful elections here um, in Ghana. Clearly throughout COVID, there has been a strong role um, for civic actors here. And, and that role continues to grow on. For those of you who are following issues in the media, there are questions about transparency and accountability. More recently, a lot of um, very national and hot debate around issues like LGBTQI plus here in Ghana um, which requires uh, a strong ecosystem of civil actors, uh, civic actors engaging in. And constantly when I, I sit here in the UN and my colleagues say, we want to go to government to advocate for this on behalf of people, I keep saying our role is to support civic actors to be able to advocate those issues. If they can, our success should be measured not on how effective we are at advocating, but on how effectively we see other actors, particularly civic actors, um, engaging in the right kind of advocacy. Here, there's a strong push for an affirmative action bill that will see more women uh, participate in, in politics. Um, Ghana is better than Nigeria, but still has a ways to go. And on the continent, we know there are not enough women um, in leadership positions participating in political uh, dialogue and leading political change. And so the role and space for civic actors to do this um, because Ghanaians want it, Nigerians want it, not because the UN says uh, that they want this. And so there's been some pushback to where uh, actors have said to me, both over the elections and more recent issues, we need the UN to be much stronger on this. And, and I say back to them, actually, we need you to be more stronger on these issues because um, it's important that national development will be led by, by, nation, by nationals. And so the, the kind of particularly when it comes to this big financing, the kind of engagement and, and oversight and insights that civil society have to the kind of financial frameworks that countries are agreeing, 
uh, what money is used for, whether it's COVID relief funding or it's actually build back better, build forward better kind of uh, economies. What's that mix between debt and equity? Um, how is the government using its resources to leverage other actors to bring the resources to the table to whom they must be accountable to? Really, really important uh, roles for civil society towards achieving the SDGs. And not just focusing on SDG 1 to 5, you know, around sort of zero hunger, zero poverty, uh, gender equality, but also the other things that if the economy is growing, if this, uh, if industry is expanding, if we have a better uh, approach to climate resilience and climate recovery, then we will have a better economy, which means more health-seeking behavior. So let's not just focus at one end, but across the spectrum of the, the sustainable development goals. That makes a lot of sense. And one thing that you noted, especially when it came to the democratic process of, of Ghana, that they were able to um, that they were able to um, pull things together because of the civic actors that were in place. So it's, it takes the nonprofit organizations that represent the people to actually push uh, to contribute to SDGs. So I have another question. And I think you covered this, but maybe you have a, a bit more to say. What are the priorities for the UN in the context of addressing SDGs, SDG 2020 to 2030 uh, target? This is by Joe Otubas. Mm. So hi, Joe. How are you? I hope everything is good with you guys. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the Afghan. Yay, go Afghan. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 you know, I think I think the the kind of key things that I've mentioned uh, are extremely important. It's nine years now uh, to go, and um, those nine years are going to go very rapidly. And we know that the impacts of COVID have been really strong in terms of dragging back um, progress in a number of different areas. And so the kind of investments that are required um, to really make sure that the next nine years count is really, really important. And maybe not even focus on achieving all of the SDGs in certain contexts, but then say, what do we need to, to achieve them? And as I said, some of the counter thinking that is required is that actually, uh, if you invest more just in education, but you aren't investing in jobs, and what you'll have is a pile of uh, discontented young people coming into the workplace with nothing to do. So what's the balance of investments that's required um, across all of those SDGs so that we are actually achieving sustainable uh, and sustained response? And here in Ghana, working with the Ghana government, we've been talking a lot about, um, so what are those priorities um, that, that are catalytic, that are transformative, that have multiplier effects on them? And I think stepping up all of us across these three, sec these three sectors, civil society, government, um, uh, and uh, the private sector, to then say, where should we put, not just one, not, not gamble on just one thing, but what are the things that we need to be gambling on that are likely to lead us to, to that growth place um, uh, effectively? So I, I think for us, those are the key ones, and certainly the opportunities that exist now, digital, green, inclusion never have we had that opportunity before and never have we learned enough lessons about the need now for africa to have some backbone stand up to, to on, on its own and, and utilize these institutions all the african countries are members of the united nations really push for reforms at the global level that mean we have fairer financing uh, available fairer deals if we want green climate change in africa um, but we know that a number of those economies rely on fossil fuels to generate the resources to run their economies. What kinds of negotiations should African countries be involved in in order to broker a deal that enables them not to be reliant just on fossil fuels, but to use that to leapfrog um, to the next place? And these are complex conversations and we need all the actors engaged effectively, particularly uh, civic actors. Amazing, thank you. So I have a question and a comment from um, Dr. Yudi Akman. Uh, she says here that the digital economy is a great opportunity for the development and transformation of the African continent. And she comes in here with a question saying, how are we 
tying this emerging opportunity of a post-COVID world to the global agenda of the UN and other bilateral agencies. Thanks, and, and hi, you. Yeah, I, I hope that we've um, that I've said a few of the things. I, the, you, the, you, the, mentioned, the, you mentioned a few yeah, things. Yeah. I've mentioned yes. a few of them. I agree with you. The we we just um, we just launched uh, the process to the countdown to the the Ghana census on the 29th of uh, June, and the vice president here, uh, to use his words, data is the new is the new oil, uh, and definitely data is the new oil. And, and I've talked about this in, in three kind of key dimensions. I think one of them is about transparency and accountability and how we're able to use data more effectively. Uh, if we need to raise more domestic resources, then we need to be able to account for the, those domestic resources better. We need to be able to allocate and plan. We need to look at the different contexts that we're here. But we need to use, uh, we need to increasingly see data as a source of learning. Um, and so how, how are we, learning from the pandemic uh, and making sure that we're really building uh, digital systems of learning that will enable um, the next generation to really come through. But how are we creating spaces for digital application um, to, um, I guess, uh, economic opportunity? Uh, we know that a lot of businesses did go digital during COVID. Uh, even here, my supplier of okra and uh, bono soup comes purely digitally to me every day via, really? via, via suppliers here who, who, who have been able to develop a, a, a real online business uh, in this sector in response to COVID. So though I was locked away for up to three months, I, I never lacked because of those. But how are we transforming those opportunities? And more importantly, are we engaging in the serious governance issues about who owns this data uh, ultimately exactly. and, how it, and how it will be used? And I think, yeah. again, uh, just referring back to, to Joe's point, uh, or maybe it was that, uh, Kingsley's point about kind of the, the role and space of, of civil society, in really engaging in those governance conversations, are we selling everything to Google? Twitter just announced yesterday that they are arriving here in Ghana, their first location on this continent. Uh, they are setting up, Google, Twitter is setting up here in Ghana. And so what does that mean for data and data ownership? Um, uh, are, we, are we again consumers or are we going to be owners? Um, these are big questions um, that really need to be asked uh, when it comes to, to these sorts of things. And, and how are we creating the transparency and accountability that will attract foreign direct investment um, in the droves that it needs to come in, but foreign direct investment that works for us. In the presentation we were in um, just before this, and uh, the other countries should, should remain unnamed, they're talking about uh, countries, investors coming in and being able to repatriate 100% uh, of their profits. We know that one of the biggest things, uh, biggest problems facing Africa's supply of resources is illicit financial flows. Uh, how are we setting up systems, investment systems, that allow the resources that belong to the continent to stay on the continent rather to, than to be sucked through a long straw out of the continent to enable exactly. uh, other continents to, to continue with their models? The UN exactly. belongs to all of us, and so we must use the UN to achieve uh, Africa's development objectives uh, as well as the global uh, development objectives. And those two things are not in conflict, in my, in my opinion. Interesting. This is, is, is really is really something in terms of um, trying to make sure that we're able to um, develop Africa as a whole. And like you said, data being the new oil, who is going to own the data? Are we going to be consumers or producers of data? And how are we even going to navigate that? Um, it's I've really been on the whole fourth industrial rev, uh, revolution in terms of how that is going to work. So, um, I just had a, have another comment from uh, Abu Bakr Abdullahi, <laughs> one of my great supporters. Interesting conversation on SDGs. So I think that would be a good way to just segue to get a sense of what your final thoughts are with regards to achieving SDGs, et cetera. And any final words, Charles? Um, well, th thank you very much. I mean, it, it, it's a huge opportunity maybe for me to step back a bit from the day-to-day -day work here. And uh, I assure you there's, there's huge amounts of it every day. I can to imagine. Begin to think, 
to begin to really think about what those um, those big those big questions are. Um, I, I still think that um, at the bottom of all this, um, and in the context of trying to recover from COVID and not even being sure is the vaccine the solution. Uh, are there new other technologies that are coming along that will make it cheaper and easier for countries to recover back? The important, uh, the important thing here is to have a sense of hope and direction. I think the Sustainable Development Goals it is the, the consensus built agenda of what at least the baseline should be for everybody. A world without hunger, a world without poverty, uh, a world where people increasingly are able to realize uh, their rights. We know that rights is the journey and has always been a journey. And so um, there are standards that are set up here. The question is less about how it is, is less about the standard, but the journey that we use to go, to go towards achieving um, that standard here. And I think that the, the level of partnership and engagement between um, civic actors, the private sector, the UN and governments needs to be strengthened even more and called for more robustly um, across different, the different spaces. Um, and we just must be mindful of those. And so often when, when we're also in fragile context and, and things seem to be crumbling, it's easy to lose hope. But I think that actually the SDGs offer a great rallying place to measure where there is progress. And there is no country that does not have progress in certain areas. And then to then figure out where there isn't progress and then ask the more productive solutions oriented question, what do we do next? What are our big strategic choices to make? And so um, that's the mix that we're in um, on a day to day basis here. Um, and really it's been exciting for me so far. Okay. Thank you so much, Charles. You really, yeah, repping us really well out there, you know, re representing <laughs> us well. I mean, with regards to transition into going into diplomacy and really going macro and, and, and mm -hmm. you know, really seeing and tracking the change with regards to SDGs in Africa as a whole. This is, this was a, this is a great conversation. Um, we, we were all looking forward to this conversation and you did not disappoint. So <laughs> thank you so much, uh, uh, Charles. You, you, you really knocked it out of the park. So um, this is definitely not gonna be our last encounter on Dev Sector Series. There's gonna be a lot more conversation going on with regards to where Africa is going in terms of how we're looking to the future, how we're meeting, um, and how we're catching up and, and, and really making sure that we're part of the conversation with regards to the fourth industrial revolution and how we're even building the continent as a whole. So again, thank you so much. And I look forward to talking with you at another time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Efwa. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank hope, you. To, to see, hope to see you all soon sometime. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Okay, so thank you all so much for joining us with, with Mr. Charles Abani, the UN Resident Coordinator in Ghana. See you all again next week. Take care.